within the Department of uh, International Relations and Cooperation, where we engage South Africans and the rest of the uh, community, um, African community and global community on South Africa's foreign policy program, activities, and posture, and a whole lot of uh, issues that are to do with South Africa's image abroad. So I'm quite happy that uh, you joining us uh, this afternoon to engage us on quite an important issue for the continent, for the people of South Africa, the people of uh, the, the rest of this important continent, as we look at issues of peace and security. Well, we know that um, the 2020 was the year that um, the African Union set itself a, a quite a, an important, very important uh, initiative that uh, it aims to silence the guns in 2020. It was part of the AU Agenda 2063. So an integrated, integrated prosperous and peaceful Africa uh, driven by its own citizen and representing a dynamic force in the international arena as well. So it envisage a peaceful Africa that needs to, to be achieved. So a lot of people were saying that uh, with the gun silence in 2020, well, not all. We still have areas where we are having conflict in the continent. And one of the reasons for that failure of 2020 goal was the that some people are saying it was too ambitious, given the number of conflict that still persists in the continent as well. So there are some of the issues. Well, of late, we have had um, to um, report a number of um, uh, violent conflicts, be it in Sudan and um, unrest in Eswatini. We have seen what's been currently happening in Ethiopia as well. So we really want to ask the question, can we mark progress as far as uh, silencing the guns are concerned? Are we making progress? What are the shortcomings? What are some of the issues that we still need to um, focus on? So we thought we should invite um, speakers who are quite familiar and the uh, experts as far as peace and security is concerned, but experts in African culture as well, African history, um, peace and security issues as well, which are quite pivotal for, for this important discussion. So I'm glad that uh, you're joining us. Well, those who are participating us via Microsoft Teams, they can actually um, put comments on the comment section as well, should they want to raise their hand. But always um, have your uh, camera on when you speak um, and for the purpose of this uh, important webinar, which will be happening for the next 60 minutes, we want to make sure that uh, everyone can uh, um, participate through our social media at Ubuntu Radio and uh, also at the Department of International Relations and Cooperation social media pages as well, including YouTube. You can get this discussion. So let's get underway. In terms of the expert, I'm joined by Professor Ngome Zulu. He's a full professor of political science, deputy dean of research. He's with the University of the Western Cape. And uh, we know that uh, he teaches African intellectual perspective, international relations theory, and um, he has seven academic degrees in politics, history, education. So an all-rounder when it comes to African history, also our culture and our heritage. Someone who is constantly analyze our current political system in South Africa and also in the continent as well. We're also going to be joined um, on the program, Professor Sipamad Lazon. He's with the University of Johannesburg. We know that uh, he's the current chair of the BRICS think tank. So a scholar in international relations as well, and um, was um, the former chair of the uh, Department of Politics and um, International Relations at the University of uh, Pretoria, and also um, been involved in ACCORD and also Institute for Global Dialogue as an executive director. We're also going to um, um, invite uh, uh, expert opinion from uh, Professor Richard Mulapo, um, Rashid Mulapo, independent scholar and professor of African history and an, an, an analyst of our current political and uh, African history as well. So I'm quite glad that we've got a variety of uh, um, experts who have got uh, uh, knowledge in history and also our culture. Importantly, the involvement of young people, how important is it? Well, we have invited Cynthia Chikwenya. She is uh, the um, African Union um, Youth Ambassador-elect who is um, representing the uh, SADC region 
and will talk to us about youth participation on issues of peace and security issues. How organize our young people? So we want to talk to her about that. So, so for the purpose of uh, this discussion, we'll just uh, request everyone to just greet um, with your video on, because I see that uh, um, the um, number of guests are still going to join us as well. Um, their uh, cameras are still off. So if you can just switch on your camera as well so that everyone can uh, see you, that will be um, appreciated indeed as uh, we begin um, with this, this discussion. Well, thank you so, so much. Thank you so much uh, as we begin this discussion. Well, the question is, um, how do we then begin to comprehend a peaceful Africa, a prosperous Africa, free of conflict? Is it possible? What is the involvement of uh, young people? Where do we start by looking at how do we, I've heard, heard scholars talking about this decolonized peace that Africa needs to have. When you talk about peace in African continent, are we talking about peace just in jail for the sake of peace? So some of the issues that we want to talk to. So for a start, I want to invite uh, Professor Ngome Zulu to just, just give us um, some opening remarks, three to five minutes. And then I will give um, uh, Ms. Chikwenya just uh, also three to five minutes of her opening remarks as well. Professor Ngomenzu. Uh, no, thank you very much uh, for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part uh, of uh, this uh, gathering, uh, yeah. given the fact that uh, a lot has been happening uh, since uh, uh, we had our local government election, but that is just in the local context. Globally, a lot has been happening. And uh, across the African continent, uh, you started off by talking about uh, silencing the guns and then trying to establish the extent to which we have succeeded in doing that. And if you look across the continent, we've been dealing with uh, the DRC, dealing with the Central African Republic, uh, recently Mozambique, Sudan, South Sudan, and the list goes on. So basically, we are having a continent that is uh, not short of activities, uh, but sadly, most of these activities are not uh, on the positive side. And then the question will be, uh, why are we here? How did we get here? And then how do we redeem ourselves? Uh, in fact, when you invited me to come here, I was reminded of something that happened when I was in the US. One of the professors asked me a very dumb Then once I had come down, I responded, they will stop as soon as you stop sponsoring them. And there was a deafening silence. And the reason I was saying that uh, was because we normally say our continent is rich but poor, which is an irony. And yeah. then most of our resources are taken outside the continent. And then when they come back, we pay exorbitant amounts of money to buy the final, the final products. I was then saying if Jonas Savimbi could um, a wage war against government from 1975 until 2002, then without the resources, obviously that would have been impossible. Then the question was, where did he get the money from? If Alfonso Lagama in Mozambique could fight the government since 1975 until he died, where would he be getting resources from? If the situation uh, in Nigeria, more especially in the Niger Delta, is as chaotic as it is, then where do these people get the money from? The answer for me was, uh, the international partners are the ones who are sponsoring our conflicts because they are benefiting from them. But then Africans can also not be deprived of agency which means we also collude uh, with the international community. So basically, I think the question we are tackling <clears throat> is a very interesting one for a number of reasons, because it forces us to do, <clears throat> first of all, self-introspection and ask ourselves, what is it that we've done wrong? And then if we want to get out of this quagmire, what are the kinds of things that we need to put in place going forward? So I think as my opening remarks, then I would just appreciate the opportunity and also also applaud you for the topic that you selected, more especially at the time when we're trying to reflect on how far we've gone in terms of silencing this uh, silencing the gun across the African continent. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Prof. Really important um, input. Uh, already, I know that uh, it's going to be quite heated because I know that a lot of people who want to find out then who is financing, for what benefit. Uh, when Africa is in conflict, it looks like there are people who benefit the, the most, definitely not Africans. We'll look at that. And I want us to look at then how do we make sure that we cut the umbilical cord of violence in the continent as well, and which are affecting um, our most vulnerable as well. We're talking about um, women. We're talking about the youth. Well, talking about the youth, let's involve now 
the um, African Union um, Youth Ambassador-elect for the um, CETEC region here. Um, her name is uh, uh, Ms. Cynthia Chiguena. She's here with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Tali, for having us. Can you guys hear me clearly? Yeah, if you can just take your voice up a bit. Yeah. All right. So thank you very much for extending this invitation. And it's, it's really humbling to be on the same panel with our professors and, and doctors. And as a UJ uh, alumni myself, it's, it's, it's quite humbling to, to, to hear from them. And uh, in the light of youth and women's participation, which you mentioned, I will, I will say this to you, Tali. It's, it's saddening to see that there is only one youth and one female on your, on your panel. So, which means that even, even DECO itself is following the trend we're seeing across the continent, where you have for 55 states, you have only two female presidents representing along gender lines. So that's something we can, we can look out for for the next um, webinar and the next engagement. But um, just in the same uh, wavelength as, as, as the uh, professor who spoke before me said, uh, Chinua Achebe says, when brothers fight, it is, the, it is the stranger who benefits from the inheritance. So that just echoes to the need for coherence on the African continent to silencing the guns and to, um, to fighting against um, civil wars and the various insurgencies we have seen. As the opening remarks, I would also just highlight that Southern Africa region has been fortunate to not have suffered from, from years of terrorist attacks and, and insurgencies, as is the case in, in the DRC, for instance, in Kibbutz, where you have insurgents groups coming up, as is the case in, in North Africa, in Somalia as well. So, so Southern Africa was quite privileged for a long time to be, to be excluded from the trend that we're seeing in East Africa and other parts of, of the continent. But recently, with the case of Cabo Delgado, the jihad insurgencies that, that came about, it was really a wake-up call to say it's only a matter of time before the situation in Mozambique happens in Zambia, before the situation in Mozambique extends to Malawi, to South Africa as well. And with the nature of um, globalization, it's, it, it's really something that national governments need to focus on. So as the opening remarks, I just... Um, reiterating what Prof said, that there is need, first of all, for coherence on the continent so that our efforts are coordinated and we're not susceptible to influences that are really financed or backed by external actors. And um, finally, as part of the closing remarks, it is also to say that I am, apart from being the African Union uh, Youth Ambassador elect, I work for a non-governmental organization and um, or a political foundation, which is uh, the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung. And often there is this paradigm of criticizing the African Union or silencing the guns and saying it is too ambitious, it is too this. But I'd also like to call the House to attention that the African Union is made up by our different states. So if the African Union is failing, it is a reflection of us failing at the national level because our combined efforts then make up the 55 states that make the commission. So really we need to go back to the grassroots and say, where can South Africa act? Where can Zimbabwe act? Where can Malawi act? So that our coordinated efforts can create a more successful African Union in combination. So thank you very much. And, and those are the brief remarks for me. Yeah. Uh, th Mr. Chigwenya, thank you so much for that. Uh, let me just say it from the onset that uh, you are much more capable of uh, representing our African youth and women in particular in this discussion. I'm, I'm glad you will carry the weight and I'm not sure, I don't think it will be heavy for you today. Just uh, allow us for the next 60 minutes to, for you to carry that important weight um, in your shoulder just for today. And uh, I definitely acknowledge that we didn't need more wider uh, participation as well, which is quite important. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think um, what um, Mr. Wanya said that it directs us to the issue of good neighborliness. That we cannot have a situation where one, where your neighbor is in trouble, and you thinking that does just affect your neighbor. And because uh, Professor. Um, Mulapo, you are much more also concerned about our history and where we, we, we come from. It's important, uh, Prof, um, to, 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 say, to look at the origins of this conflict to say, uh, 
Africa w- was once one, just one continent, you know, and the, all these divisions, what separates us is maybe back in the days what unites us as well. Take us through um, some, some, of the, some of the background, but also how do we then make sure that we use our history and benefit from our history in order to solve some of these uh, conflicts? Professor Mlap. Hi, Prof. Hello. I can hear you now. Uh, Professor Malapo, you have the floor. Um, you're still muted, I see. Uh, I can see you. Um, your your video is on. I'm just waiting to I can to see your face, and then your audio uh, can come through as well. Let me see if I can. Uh, oh yeah, I can mute you from this side. If I can just get an assistant from our team, um, so that uh, I can hear you. I can hear you, but. Uh, He's not muted from our site. He must unmute himself. Um, Prof, if you, yeah, I think you are fine now. Is it clear? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. I was saying thank you very much for uh, organizing this uh, important uh, uh, discussion, a very pertinent and current uh, issue. Um. Yes, I share the views of the two colleagues, uh, Professor Mkwemeng Zulu and uh, uh, Cynthia Mgwenya, on the issues that they've highlighted. Um, but um, yes, I think the sponsorship of this conflict is, for me, as, uh, an important issue. But for how long? Because we have seen this in the past, from the colonial days, how this uh, continent of ours was, uh, you know, partitioned and uh, various, uh, you know, economic interests from outside the country. The question that I'm always having is about uh, the role of us as Africans, you know, getting involved in such a conflict because, one, we, you know, we're talking about a decolonized uh, continent but still, you still have uh, elements that are not uh, pursuing the, you know, the democratic ideal. Uh, especially if you look at, you know, the democratic institutions that have been established in Africa, uh, that uh, you are not going to allow military seizure of power, but uh, you know, you really allow the democratic processes of electing. Uh, government of, you know, people's choice. Now, if you look at, uh, especially the countries that you have mentioned, Swaziland, the Sudan, Ethiopia, that uh, these conflicts are raging on. Um, the second issue that I, you know, I also wish to to look at is in terms of our institutions. You know, you have got uh, the African Union, which has an important role to play. But when it's weak, it's not able to fulfill its responsibilities. And uh, being able to say, when you have got a, a government that was elected democratically, you will not recognize uh, a government that has come through military force because uh, it has got a bearing on civil society, you know, this kind of rights that people have to exercise. Um, I mean, you saw that in West Africa, the Cote d'Ivoire situation as well. But the point I'm making is that uh, really we need to learn from our history as we move forward and to say that uh, 
Are we successful in silencing these guns? Or are we using this more in terms of, uh, you know, it's just a, a propaganda or it's just a statement that we are making that uh, African states really need to support one another. The concept of neighborliness is very important. And then I think, uh, yeah, I think let me stop here for now. Uh, yes, thank you. Hello. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. Um, I want to ask you to adjust your, your camera a bit to, to take it a bit lower. Um, so that, yes, we, we're getting there, we're getting there. Um, if you can take it a bit lower and then a bit further, further, uh, further away, just a little bit. But we'll, we'll get into, into that as well again. Okay. I want to bring in Professor uh, Mugame Zulu. In terms of um, conflicts in, um, I mean, we, we've been looking at the situation in Ethiopia. We've been talking about uh, a situation in Sudan as well. There's, a, there's an issue of people feeling a bit of, we know that there's been progress in, in, in Sudan somewhat um, with the restoration of the prime minister. Um, are we seeing Africans now saying, we, we, want, we want a voice? And some people were saying in their study to say, this conflict is going to be perpetuated by the fact that there isn't um, um, enough political participation um, uh, from different sectors, so to speak. I know we cannot rush all the conflicts to be emanating from one source. What are some of the major trends? Uh, no, thank you very much for that question. Uh, honestly speaking, as you just pointed out, uh, the causal factors cannot be confined to a specific issue. There are a number of them. And uh, in most cases, they start from genuine concerns. And these concerns uh, include inter alia. Uh, poverty uh, in a country, maladministration, uh, corruption, and such related issues. So these are genuine concerns uh, which we'll find everywhere, including unemployment, of course, because once a country faces economic stagnation, then obviously uh, there will be political turmoil as a consequence thereof. So if you look, for example, if I can just cite one uh, example uh, in, in what has just happened in Mozambique, in northern Mozambique, we are talking about uh, insurgents, we are talking about a couple of other things, but the reality of the matter is the people of Caldebabo, uh, in fact, uh, uh, engaged in war against the authorities primarily because they've been complaining about a lot of other things uh, which uh, President Philip Nyusse was unable to address. And uh, uh, later on, when to, uh, Total came into the picture, uh, the locals were, in fact, uh, shut out. And then in response, they started then engaging in illegal activities. Uh, if you look at the situation in Sudan, which is one of the countries we've just uh, asked us to talk about, if you look at the situation in Sudan, there are a couple of, uh, uh, <clears throat> say, uh, signposts where you could um, uh, focus your discussion on. Some may look at uh, 1985 and say, this was a telling point when there was a coup in 1985. Others would say, no, 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 that one is not important. Let, let's rather focus on the 1989 coup, uh, which was staged by uh, then pre uh, the, the, the president who just, uh, who just exited the stage, Al-Bashir. Uh, because they would say that uh, after he took over, he then made sure that uh, he, he became an authoritarian figure. And then others, of course, still supported him for that, which comes to the point that the Prof Molap was making that uh, we as Africans also have a role to play in some of these conflicts, if not all of them, in one way or the other. And then, of course, uh, when people were... And we started now challenging al-Bashir, the one they hailed as the hero when he took over in 1989. They were citing similar issues of unemployment, uh, of corruption, of autocracy, and a couple of other issues. And these are genuine concerns. Then, of course, in 2019, then uh, people said, no, we've had enough. Let us uh, get him out of the picture. Then they removed him. And then we, we, the majority of the uh, global community celebrated that at long last, Sudan is going to have eternal peace. But did, they, did this become a reality? No. Because even after al-Bashir had left office, even after he had been sentenced to two years, uh, the challenges uh, that Sudan uh, was facing, is still facing the same challenges, if not worse. So then w w did this situation will then replicate itself uh, when we come to the issue of Ethiopia. But for now, I just wanted to confine myself uh, to Sudan and say that uh, 
some of the activities that we see happening in Sudan now are not new. And then, of course, uh, after Sudan, uh, after uh, the president had left, and then a number of other issues happened, and then we had um, a, a ham dog then saying that, okay, he's bringing order and so on and so forth. So basically, we are not learning from our experiences, as Prof. Malapo was saying. Ordinarily, uh, we are supposed to experience a situation once, learn from it, and then try to do everything possible to make sure that uh, history doesn't repeat itself. But unfortunately, we are not learning from that, which is why then whenever there is a political transition, I normally say uh, it's important for the new uh, the incumbent to make sure that uh, he or she doesn't repeat the mistakes of the, part, of the past, but we don't seem to be doing that. So that is, uh, in fact, unfortunate. But then, of course, uh, we'll still have this kind of thing uh, if we don't uh, uh, become honest to ourselves as we do this self-introspection. Yeah. I, I, I think, Prof, it's quite important now as we're talking about participation. We'll get into talk about the African Union in particular just now. Uh, let's look at uh, the, the sources now So some so before we can actually look at then what needs to happen um, from a political, political level also in our society. Uh, Cynthia, in terms of participation, we know that uh, we have seen about um, violence erupting in North Africa in, in the previous years as well. Talk to us about the importance of youth participation in order to make sure that we guarantee this peace that is in the continent as well, that where we have seen, um, when we achieve peace, then it beca becomes sustainable, where we say not only young people, but also women participate, and they just don't fill up the numbers, but meaning take a meaningful um, participation as well, um, Cynthia. Um, thank you very much, Sally, and thank you, Prof, for, for speaking before I do. Um, yeah, in terms of violence and youth participation, in terms of violence and youth participation, um, I, I think we also go back to issues of governance that were spoken before me. And the reason I say issues of governance, if you look particularly in the West African case of NSAS, which was a campaign that was started on social media by by um, young people in Nigeria to say end police brutality. So uh, that became some, some sort of violence and uprising in itself, but it was one that was stemming from not being heard through conventional methods of participating. So young people have tended to create their own spaces where they use tools such as social media, such as um, hashtags, hashtag answers, hashtag um, various hashtags that have been used to say, we don't agree with this and the conventional methods of participating that we have been offered as young people, they are not yielding results. So let us engage in, in, uh, in an invented way of participating, which is the use of social media movements, which is the use of uh, protests. In South Africa, we saw this with uh, with the violence against women protests that happened just before COVID-19. So it is really an invention of spaces to, to speak where systems are not allowing young people to be heard and women to be heard. In the case of South Sudan, uh, fortunately, I, I did my, some of my research on my, my thesis on, on South Sudan and the revitalized agreement on the um, on the resolution of conflict in South Sudan. And what we saw was that with the previous uh, conflict processes. They were very exclusive of not just women, but also youth. And then in the same process, they were exclusive of civil society organizations. And peace has not been uh, positive, has not been uh, sustained peace because you find that it was very exclusive and limited to, to leaders of insurgent groups or leaders of military groups. In most cases, these are men. So it was only with the revitalized agreement of the uh, resolution of conflict in South Sudan, the RARCSS, where we found that there were talks about having a, a female participant or a female vice president, one of the five vice presidents that were introduced as part of the uh, transitional revitalization transitional government of national unity in South Sudan. So we're starting to see women being given some of the positions in conflict mediation processes. We're also starting to see civil society organizations being um, 
given spaces to contribute as well as youth. And the example would be the African Union's uh, Youth for Peace Ambassadors, which came about as a resolution of the 2018 agreement to say that we need to have a representative of young people in these uh, decision-making processes and decision-making um, institutions. But in the same light, um, it is really difficult because we're talking about the youth, um, African Union's resolution coming in in 2018 to establish youth ambassadors. And in, in South Sudan's case, we're speaking about the revitalized agreement coming in and being revitalized in, in, in 2018 after the, the agreement to the resolution of conflict was um, was not respected or conflict broke out again and, and that fell apart in 2015. So it doesn't give us enough time frame to assess really how impactful the, the, the participation and engagement of young people has been. So we are starting to have young people and women occupying the spaces, but really is it meaningful participation and is it meaningful occupation of these spaces? Or is it just filling up quotas to say we have so many young people, but when it comes to decision making, then it's a different story altogether. But in the same light, we also acknowledge that I think traditionally conflict resolution has been um, either from peacekeeping to peace building. There's been a a militarized zone, a militarized area. And if you go back to, to the case of Cabo de Vado in Mozambique, you find that the immediate response was the sending in of military troops to to ensure that peace or some sort of peace is maintained or there is resistance to the military groups. So this military process is naturally or traditionally exclusive of young people. But what we are saying is let's have a multi-dimensional approach where we're not just sending the military, but let's hear from young people in Mozambique what was used to lure you into insurgency groups? Is it because you did not have a job that resulted in, in you being offered some sort of money or some sort of power to engage? So while military interventions are important and they are necessary um, in the immediate, there is need to engage and, and take a multidimensional approach, which includes women and young people as well. Yeah. It's uh, quite important. I, I know that um, I, I, your, your, your areas of expertise, post-conflict, peace building and reconstruction and development in the continent. So, so I'm really not surprised that definitely you are offering us a solution that says, let's just not go there. Um, you know, let's use military as a last resort. Have we get into a situation where we negotiate when there's conflict to say, let's come up with what is the source? Can we go to a negotiating table before we put, um, you know, um, the, the boots on the ground, you know? To what an extent are you seeing um, that happening? Um, we, some are saying that uh, what we saw in Eswatini, for example, right now, we, 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 with, the, with, 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 with the king um, agreeing to um, a dialogue, that, that becomes then a way of saying the, the channel for dialogue is open and then we can actually find out from what are the areas, what are the disagreement, what are the issue of, of, of um, but the con contestation, where is it emanating from and the solution as well. Are, are you seeing um, that uh, that's our approach um, generally or we we saying if the life being lost, we definitely need to put boots on the ground, then we can negotiate later. Uh, Cynthia, I'm still with you, yeah. Um, yes, thank you very much, Shelley, for uh, picking on some of the points raised there in terms of uh, taking a multidimensional approach. Um, and the nature of conflict itself, I think, calls more for 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 ad hoc decision to be made than than uh, a clear planned out path. And the reason I say this is because. Five years ago, perhaps no one would have predicted that would have the situation in Mozambique. Um, eight years ago, nobody would have predicted that would have the situation in, in, in Nigeria, for instance, for instance. So I think in, in this case, then ad hoc uh, meetings or ad hoc coalitions become the go-to because they, they are set up to address the conflict that has arisen and it's not something that was anticipated. So that would be the, the first point that I would like to mention. But in the in, um, 
within the same solution of saying ad hoc coalitions and to have taken the, the center stage to resolve in conflict. I also think that there is need for capacity within actors and these, and these coalitions and these missions. And the reason I say that there is need for well capacitated people is that they should be the one to be able to discern or determine what intervention is best suited for a particular context. Because what works in, in Tunisia, for instance, um, during an, an uprising of, of Arab people is not the same as what we work in, in, in Zimbabwe during political violence. It's not the same as what we work in, in Mozambique during uh, the rise of insurgents. So ad hoc coalition, they need to be made up of people who are skilled enough to determine which intervention works now. And um, perhaps you might have misinterpreted me there when I said the, the boots on the ground need to be a, uh, the, the last resolution. It, in, in the event that there are lives at risk and people need to save lives, then there is need to have that as a yeah. as the first point of, of, of intervention to say we cannot continue losing lives. There is need to to withstand the the force and the military uh, militia groups that are that are in, in a particular country. But it should not end there because if we have military intervention as our first method of response and we leave it at that, we risk the re uh, occurrence of conflicts because we have not really dealt with with the issues at hand, which are issues such as unemployment, which then end up letting people resorting to methods such as joining insurgents groups to, to have some sort of income or some sort of funding. So there is a need for uh, for a multi-dimensional approach, but also what other coalitions need to look into is having people that are well equipped to determine which intervention works best in this particular situation. And in, 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 in Mozambique's case, with the number of people that were being displaced, and uh, I think since 2017, we have over 700,000 people being eternally displaced by conflict in, in Mozambique, then perhaps the military intervention was the, was the most appropriate call while trying to, to, to integrate uh, traditional mechanisms or other methods of resolving the conflict. Yeah, yeah. I think that's um, that's quite important as well. Quite a, like multi-layered, um, as as you as you, you you did mention, Professor Mgomez. I, I was supposed to go to uh, uh, Professor Mlab, who just uh, disconnected, but I'm gonna come to you now, Professor Bekim Mgomez. In terms of uh, uh, the 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 participation, but I want to take it further because I want you then uh, go now to look at the role of multilateral bodies. Um, such as uh, the, the AU. But before then, there's just two issues. Talk about participation. Talk about the issue of uh, how concerned are African countries amongst themselves when countries is brewing in, another, on, in their neighbors as well. Um, are we concerned to even engage bilaterally? Do we still have a, a brother, you know, type of approach where you say it does not need... I'm not talking about South Africa, by the way. Um, just... Uh, just, just, just in terms of if, 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 uh, if, if Zambia has, 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 has some challenges, can actually you know approach its neighbour. Um, if Uganda has a, some some serious problem with security issues, it can approach Rwanda. Things, things like that. And before they even brew to even involve organisations such as the AU, that member countries have to take part. Talk about participation, neighbourliness. Then we we'll talk about the AU. Okay, no, th thank you very much. But uh, maybe before I address your two issues, please allow me to uh, pick up on some points that were made by my sister, the Cynthia. Uh, as she was talking, in fact, I, I was reminded of two things. One uh, is what in international relations we, we refer to as uh, uh, types of power that are used in international relations uh, cooperation. Uh, one is what we call uh, soft power. A soft power refers to a situation whereby uh, you, you use uh, diplomacy and other means uh, to persuade the warring factions uh, to try and find each other. So that becomes one option, as she was uh, in fact uh, uh, saying that uh, let's treat each case on a case by case basis before uh, deciding what to do. So that is one option. And then the other one is what we refer to as hard power. Hard power normally refers to the use of military force. And then uh, the other one uh, is called a smart power. Smart power is a combination of both. 
both soft power and hard power. So which means the point she's making, in fact, I'm just reiterating a point that uh, she's on point in saying that uh, let us address the situation as per the need so that we don't come up with a one, sh uh, uh, one shoe fits all because it's not going to help us. Then the, the, the last thing I wanted to introduce is a, a theory we normally use in international relations, which is called FA theory or frustration aggression theory. Basically trying to establish why do people resort into these violent activities? In other words, why do these conflicts occur? Why do people join Al-Shabaab? I mean, Al why do people join Boko Haram and so on and so forth? So those are some of the things maybe that we can just have at the back of our minds as we proceed. But to come back to your point about participation, uh, the, the one thing that we haven't done well uh, is to make sure that uh, in each and every country there is uh, equal representation. In other words, you look at uh, uh, in, in research in general, we normally say if you come up with a sample, a sample must be representative of the population. So in this case, if we talk about a country, country X, country Y, whatever you call it, let's look at who constitutes that polit a political entity called a country. If there are young people, that is the youth, consider them. If they are women, consider them. The elderly, consider them, and so on and so forth. Even, even disabled um, or member or people who live with uh, disabilities, consider all those as members of that population in that country. So that whenever you come up with a solution of whatever nature, whether using uh, hard power, soft power, smart power, but then make sure that uh, uh, your, your, your group is representative of that population. Because if you do that, it means that whatever solution you arrive at will have a buy-in from the different members of that particular community. If you leave one out, then of course we'll have missed out. Then on the issue of uh, African unity, we have lost it, my brother. Honestly speaking, we have lost it totally. And there are a number of reasons for this. Some date back to the colonial times uh, when Africans were bifurcated into different little compartments. Right now, we talk about Anglophone Africa, those who were, were colonized by Britain. We talk about Francophone Africa, mainly West and West Central Africa, those that were colonized by France. And then we talk about Lusophone Africa, those that were colonized by Portugal, even though they are small, your Angolas, your Mozambique, and so on and so forth. So in terms of the colonial legacy, it has made it almost difficult for us to uh, uh, see ourselves as a brother and a sister. So the us and them syndrome has been deeply entrenched. So that I rejoice when a, a neighbor uh, is suffering because I benefit from that. Either politically or economically, I benefit. So this uh, this thing of uh, uh, seeing uh, my neighbor as my brother or as my sister has disappeared. Then the next thing are these borders, which are protecting at all costs. And when South African borders are not that strong, we even complain that we have porous borders. We must make sure that uh, these borders are properly protected. That alone also uh, contributes in the sense that uh, I see someone from Mozambique as the other, someone from Zimbabwe as the other, even a country like Lesotho, which is technically in South Africa and could easily become part of the Free State province. But then they become the other uh, until there is a problem. And then if they are fighting, then they cross the border there in South Africa, we protect them, and then uh, we, we later on uh, take our soldiers and our uh, police officers to escort them back into the country. So basically, I, I think that in terms of us uh, protecting one another as Africans, that has disappeared. You see this when we go to uh, the AU summit uh, in Addis Ababa. We, we, we send our heads of state. They agree on what needs to be done. Everything on paper looks very good. But when it comes to implementation, it doesn't happen simply because of these legal compartments. After the meeting, uh, the Francophone states will meet there, the Anglophone states will meet there, SADC will meet there, ECOWAS will meet there, EAC will meet there, ECAS. So these legal compartments are therefore making it almost impossible for us to protect one another. So when a foreign a country comes in, then we just ask the question, what is in it for me, not for us? What is in it for me? If uh, your answer is in the affirmative, I will benefit. You go for it. You don't care about your neighbor. You don't care about the region. You don't care about the continent. These are some of the ills that we have to confront head on if we're serious about taking the continent forward. Thank you, sir. Yeah, it, it, it's painful. Um, it, it, it's, it's an honest assessment, but uh, painful, Prof. 
um, because then it says if we've lost the the brotherliness, you know, uh, we are not we have exhausted how South Africa used to get involved, be invited because of its a uh, um, stature um, in, in 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 resolving conflict as well because of its history and. Um, is the solution now, because I want us to get, head to the AU, we talk about regional bodies, you have already said this compartment does not help us much sometimes. Um, then where does the solution lies? If you're looking at, we have seen how Sadek got involved with the, with the, uh, President Sir Ramaphosa as the head of the organ, in terms of Eswatini issue, even going individually to meet with the king. Um, also, we have seen how um, the, the, the situation in Mozambique was dealt with at that time. Mozambique was the uh, head of uh, the, the organic SADC. And, um, I mean, if we look at, uh, at, at Sudan, there's, there's a lot of interest there because the United Nations also is involved there. Uh, there's quite a number of uh, interests in, in Sudan. So there are conflict at different levels as well in terms of the engagement of these multilateral bodies as well on peace and security. Solution lies within its own country or it needs to come from outside. Gone are, are the times where we need to bring envoys, respected leaders, right? Uh, where they're able to say, we can listen to you. We believe you can listen to us because we've got issues that we are dealing with as well. Because people are saying, maybe let's revive the, that, that this multilateral bodies, invite um, uh, former leaders, to be able to deal with these issues. Where does the solution lies? AU, SADC, regional bodies? Yeah, you, you are muted, Prof. Um, you, are, you are muted. Um, yeah, I was saying maybe before I respond to a question, uh, Cynthia's hand is up. I, I don't know if she wanted to ask an, an I, I think I didn't see her hand. She, she, she may come in, Prof. Uh, Cynthia, you can, you can come in. Um, I, I, I like the fact that, uh, Prof, you have already acknowledged just how far uh, uh, Cynthia is. So I'm seeing a PhD loading, so <laughs> she might do a PhD in 12 months. Oh, yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Miss Iguanya, it's your floor. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Tali, and thanks, Prof. I, I've already done my second master's, so now I, I need to, to focus on experience. But, Prof, as you picked on, on the different types of power, and um, I think my, my first degree is in international relations and soft power and hard power. There, there is a concept of, of, of international relations that came to mind, and I think our, our audience will benefit from it. And it's the issue of state sovereignty. To what extent does that challenge the brotherliness that Tali was speaking about? To what extent does, does that sovereignty, because we've seen it playing out in in post-electoral violence where, you know, some other state says, no, South Africa can't intervene because you have xenophobia. No, this country can't intervene because we have sovereignty. So maybe Prof can, can enlighten us and, and the audience. To what extent the state sovereignty challenges the brotherliness and also the resolution of conflicts, especially in our region? Uh, Prof, you are still muted. You are still muted. Uh, you need to repeat your comment right from the oh, beginning. Okay, you were no, laughing at something. I missed it completely. <laughs> no, I was saying thank you very much, uh, uh, Cynthia, for this important question. And then I was saying I'll respond to it through you, Chair. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, uh, state sovereignty is a very critical issue in international relations um, uh, thinking and writing for a number of reasons. And it goes together uh, with the theory called realism. Uh, we normally say realism is state-centric, basically meaning that everything that happens revolves around the state. And we normally juxtapose it with the institutionalism, whereby institutions matter more than uh, the state. So in this case, the questions that we are dealing with revolve between the two. On the one hand, you have state uh, sovereignty, whereby the individual state will have it, uh, uh, I mean, all the rights to decide what is good for that particular state at a particular given time. But then on the other hand, we have to operate within certain institutions. Be they regional institutions like the ones we've just highlighted, your SADC, your, 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 your ECOWAS, your EAC, your ECAS, and so on and so forth, 
or, or you can just operate um, as an individual country, basically uh, subscribing to the realist theory. For example, one of the reasons why uh, it has taken the continent uh, too long uh, to get involved in the Ethiopian crisis with the Tigray commotion that is happening there is partly because the Ethiopian government has been uh, making us believe that uh, they have the situation under control. Even at the time when we're told that um, uh, the, the Tigrid, uh, People's Liberation Front is advancing to the capital, but then the leaders of the country were saying that, no, 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 don't worry, we have the situation under control. The same situation also happened in Mozambique. Uh, President Philippe Nyuse was saying that, no, don't worry about northern Mozambique. Uh, well, well, the commotion that is happening in Cabo Delgado is under control. Uh, we don't need any foreign assistance. And you can't just go in there by virtue of the fact that you are a SADC member state. You will only go there after the president of the country invoking state sovereignty after he signed those documents which allow a foreign um, a, a country uh, to come in and assist. So until that happens, then we cannot um, um, I mean, go in there. But then this goes together uh, with what is referred to in the UN as R2P, Responsibility to Protect. In which case then, as a country, as a member state of the UN, you have the right to intervene if a, a particular country is under attack. You go there and assist the country. But at the same time, you can also go in if you are of the view that uh, the leader in that particular country is in fact ill-treating his or her own people. That is what in fact uh, the, uh, I mean, um, uh, Libya uh, experienced uh, in 2011. Um, uh, because the argument that was made there, uh, rightly or wrongly so, they were saying that uh, a NATO is coming in because um, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi is becoming a problem to his own people. Of course, you and I know that that was a lie, a blatant lie. And the idea there was to just uh, get rid of uh, Muammar Gaddafi. As a result, Libya is worse off now than it was under Colonel Muammar Gaddafi. So in brief, uh, state sovereignty then comes in that context. But then to come back to your, uh, to your point, Chair, uh, about finding a solution, uh, it will be very difficult to find uh, a panacea to this whole thing. Uh, as Cinder was saying, each case is different. In some instances, you only need people in that country to put their heads together and then find a solution. For example, if people are complaining about corruption uh, in country X, it would be unwise for country Y to chip in and say, we are coming here to address corruption. Because people in that country are capable of addressing that. All they need is the political will to do the right thing. But the moment uh, you have a, situ a situation whereby challenges are beyond the control uh, of people in that country, then in that case, uh, you have all the rights to uh, talk to the neighbor. Normally, it comes back to your initial point where you said that uh, as Africans, uh, we should make sure that uh, we help one another where necessary and where possible. Like, for example, it has happened in the case of South Africa, whenever a Swatin is, is facing a, either economic challenges or political challenges, we chip in. We've done that in the DRC, we've done that in Burundi, we've done that in Sudan, we've done it across the continent. But unfortunately, other countries invoke this concept, which I think I was talking about, sovereignty. They say, no, we are a sovereign state. We don't need South Africa. In one of the African countries, in fact, where I spent a year, I was told by some people in that country, which I will not mention, that South Africa is trying to be Africa's America. It was a sad statement, but the more I heard about it, it kept reverberating in my ears. And then when I looked at some of the statements that were made, even by people I trusted, then I was so disappointed. So which means that at one point I ended up with a concept that the rest of the African continent hates us, but they also can't live without us. Then it comes to that threat because in terms of resources, they will come to South Africa when crunch time comes. But when things are normal, they would say South Africa is becoming a bully. You saw what happened in Central African Republic, for instance, where we ended up losing our soldiers. When we went in there invoking R2P, we were told we are going there because of our own business interest. That was the interpretation that was presented. So the reality of the matter is, uh, as Cinder was saying, we will deal with each situation as it presents itself where possible. The nationals in that country must solve their own problems. Once they fail, then neighbors must come in, then the region, then the continent, 
Then as a last result, multilateral institutions. To, to bring in multilateral institutions, first and foremost, that will be a disaster because the, some of them come with vested interests, which are not at the uh, advantage of the locals who are experiencing the problems in the first place. Thank you. Yeah, uh, merit interest. I, 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 we, as we draw closer, we've got about uh, five, five minutes, Prof. Um, I know where I come from, in Matangar, in Venda. Um, the, the, the local chiefs to have so much power where if there is any community dispute, we go to, to him and whatever he says, um, he says goes and we sit around the table, everyone, uh, you know, decide. How much are we tapping into that? That's uh, a side well, issue, but also please com comment generally on uh, some, some key solutions that we can draw off that are not exhausted. No, we are making a critical point. In fact, uh, the institution of traditional leadership is very critical in assisting us to resolve some of these problems. Unfortunately, our political leadership says a lot and does very little or nothing. Uh, truth be told, uh, when uh, the, 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 the governing party, the ANC, was preparing to govern, as it were, uh, the thought at, at the time was that we're going to build a socialist state. That was one point. And then secondly, we're saying that uh, traditional leaders will have no future uh, in the new South Africa because they uh, allegedly colluded with the colonialists and they also colluded with the apartheid government. Until around 1993, at a meeting that was held outside Pretoria, that was only at that time that we decided, no, we cannot do without traditional leaders, which is why in the interim constitution in 1993, we then um, inserted a chapter on the institution of traditional leadership. Then in the final constitution in 1996, we also embraced traditional leaders. The reality of the matter is we have not used them optimally. They have the ability to assist us in resolving some of the challenges. And coincidentally, uh, most of our four uh, um, uh, fathers who were the leaders of this continent, they were also traditionalists by themselves. And they were also educated and they were also religious people. So a combination of all of those would assist us. Like in the case of the ANC, for example, if you look at what happened uh, uh, in, in Free State in 1912, there were traditional leaders. There were church people, there were politicians. So the bottom line, therefore, is that in order for us to find a solution, let us identify all the, po the possible or potential role players, bring them under the roof, and then solicit their views. Because if you rely on one source and one source only, we're going to miss the point. That is why earlier on I said uh, we need everyone, we need to consider the population before we decide on the sample that is going to assist us in resolving the issue. Once we get it right there, then we'll be fine. Uh, if, if we then uh, look at uh, what the late KK Kaunda, that is uh, the, the late president of Zambia, or Julius Nyerere in Tanzania, they were prepared to delay their own independence, the independence of their own countries for the sake of their neighbors. In the case of uh, um, uh, Nyerere, for example, he said he is prepared to wait until both Uganda and Kenya get their independence so that they, they could be independent at the same time. Those are the kinds of leaders who are not uh, serving their own interests, but they were concerned about fellow Africans and they were concerned about the continent. But right now, the caliber of leaders that we have, they leave a lot to be desired, honestly speaking. Then we need to start from there before we go to the communities. Mm. Cynthia Chiguen? Um, I think if it were up to me, Tali, we could have just ended the session because I don't want to dilute what Prof says. But those are very powerful remarks, Prof, and, and thank you for, for, for touching on many aspects, even taking us back to, to the pre-independence era where we had Pan-Africanism, and, and I was in Addis Ababa last week for the Peace and Security Division appointment of Youth Ambassadors. And, and you can tell just from, from the structure and the atmosphere around the ages, it is that of Pan-Africanism that you, that you don't find everywhere else. So thank you very much for bringing us back to that. Now, uh, to, to give my closing remarks, um, Tali Prof mentioned that there are some cases that individual states can deal with, issues such as corruption, issues such as um, 
perhaps frustration of the citizens, and these are things that don't need multilateralism to come out. And um, I think fortunately or unfortunately, we're, we're grateful that COVID has seen a lot of Western countries looking inward and saying, you guys focus on yourselves. We need now to focus on uh, Brexit. We need now to focus on, on America first. And that was a wake up call to, to many African countries to say, okay, how do we do this? How do we digitalize? How do we have a COVID-19 response as a nation before we even go back to what the international, what is being detected in the um, international arena? So fortunately or unfortunately that that has worked out in, in some cases and we have really seen your original institutions. I got in, 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 in South Sudan, for instance, really upped its game because America during Trump's uh, regime was no longer involved. Uh, Britain was focusing on Brexit and, and so forth. So that really left a gap and we saw the regional mechanism I got coming up to, to, to take charge of conflict resolution in, in South Sudan. And in the same case we have seen because of COVID-19, national states coming up to say this is our own response and we are dictating this on our own because there isn't really that much of, a, there is declining multilateralism the face of the, the crisis. But overall, going back to, to what Prof said about resolving issues nationally and having national um, solutions to challenges that we are facing, that brings us to one of the issues that is civil education of the people. Because for the government to be accountable to the people, we need to create a population that demands accountability from the government and reminds them that there is constitutionalism and reminds them that the government is for the people and with the people. And once we divert from that, it is the people who need to call back the, the, the government to order. And, and going back to the principle of democracy, which is uh, demos and kratos, meaning power by the people. So we really need to educate the civilian population to say, in the event that this happens, it is the civilians who need to, to bring the government to power before we even go back to external states, because the supreme power in any country really is a constitution, and the constitution is for the people. So there is need to, we have this wonderful vehicle, which is a constitution, but we need to ensure that the people who drive it or the people who own this constitution know what it should and can do for them. So those are just my, my closing remarks. Oh, lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I can, I think, Prof, you concur with me that uh, uh, Mr. Chiguenya, as, um, as, as an ambassador um, uh, elect for the Sadiq region, we are well represented here in the region and uh, uh, really, uh, I'm quite glad that um, in one of her first engagement on this role, she has chosen Ubuntu Radio and the Department of International Relations to engage on this platform. Really, I want to commend you, uh, Ms. Chigwenya, for this important engagement to come through to speak to us as well. Thank you so much for in, um, allowing us to engage you on this hour, and um, I really appreciate you as continue to engage on, this, uh, on these issues as well in the continent, and also update us in terms of your program going forward and we are looking forward for your inauguration in uh, in the next uh, meeting when the heads of states of the african union meets thank you so much mm -hmm. thank you so much Sam. yeah another one eh? prof concluding remarks let's conclude no no, no. just to uh, echo your sentiments that uh, yasinda in fact didn't get into this position by chance she deserves yeah. to be there and we, we, we've seen what she's capable of. I wish you could have a number of uh, uh, youngsters who, who, who are um, uh, operating in the same manner that she's done. Because I always say any country which doesn't take care of its youth is already doomed. Because uh, those who are currently occupying certain positions, they've run their course. When they exit the stage, they should uh, uh, pass the baton to people they can trust who are going to take this country forward. If we can uh, multi, uh, multiply the likes of Cynthia, then obviously we can be assured that our continent is in safe hands. But if we give the continent to people we don't trust, then obviously this continent of ours will be a playing ground for the West. Uh, they've started doing it, but it will get worse by day. Now, thank you very much for convening this discussion. I also learned a lot from it. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming through. Let me also take thanks, uh, uh, Professor Mulapo as well. Couldn't uh, connect going forward because of uh, network issues, but let me appreciate him as well for coming through. All of my guests, uh, let me thank you so much. Uh, as you heard, the Professor Bekim Gomez is a full professor of political science. Uh, he's the also deputy dean of research, University of Western Cape. Really, it's always a pleasure and eye opener to engage him because he 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 does throw the punches, and uh, I think um, he needs to be commended. It for for seeing it like it is honest honest um, opinion and analysis of what is happening in the continent what needs to be done by our leaders by our youth by all of us in the position of influence as well in the community that we find ourselves in let me also thank miss cynthia chigoya she's the uh, African Union Youth uh, Ambassador elect uh, for the uh, SADC region, and uh, really a pleasure for you all to join us this uh, um, afternoon as well. Thank you so much. Uh, this concludes our meeting as well, and we can continue to engage ourselves on uh, Ubuntu Radio every um, every day on uh, channel Triple Eight on DSTV as well, also on our social media platform. Thank you so much all for joining us. Thank you. Nilibu and Dawendo. Oribu and Thank you. Thank you. Nah.